Everyone do something for me for one second before we start. Breathe in. Breathe out. Peace of God. And also, thank the Lord for air conditioning. Record-breaking heat today. Uh, you know what? The first thing I thought when I got up is, I'm going to go to church because this will be a lot cooler. <laughs> In every respect. Okay, so as Tom said this morning, right just now, he said we are going to start a new series about the kingdom of God is like. Uh, I will say this was, this was a lot of fun um, working through, praying through, wrestling with some challenges. Uh, we are going to read through some verses today, some of which I have struggled in the past to understand. And what's really great is the revelation of the Lord comes to those who seek. In fact, the parables in Jesus' explanation of them says as much. So I'm going to start with a phrase that I want you guys to keep in your minds throughout the message today, and actually throughout the next four weeks as we work on this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus says this several times through the parables. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's an invitation. Jesus, in speaking to the crowds, is giving an invitation, but he doesn't just lay out a whole series of facts and expect you to understand it, and by so doing, come to a revelation. That actually, that type of thinking is very Greek. It's actually very Western. It's what we work out of today. We think if we learn facts, we become more knowledgeable. And when we become more knowledgeable, we have some form of power. Knowledge is power. This is the very basis for our education system. This is the very basis for how we derive who's worth having a job. This is how we derive just about all value and all value metrics in the entire Western world is the basis of our knowledge. Jesus in delivering parables was actually laying out for all future time something that the Jews kind of already knew, which is revelation comes first through humility and ultimately through relationship with God. Faith is the catalyst by which we learn, not the other way around. And as you under, if you put that filter in how you read the parables, it actually makes a lot more sense. Because Jesus was saying, you can't just figure your way out to heaven. It starts with the revelation of God. So, in Matthew 13, if you guys would like to open there, this chapter is pretty much all parables. In fact, this is the, where it begins. So let's start with this. What is a parable anyway? We've heard the phrase before, parable. Maybe you haven't, and if you haven't, that's okay. A parable, it quite simply is a story told to convey a truth. Jesus used parables. Depending on how you gauge what a parable is, Jesus uh, has recorded about 38 parables or so in the Gospels. And there are a couple of different types of parables. There's the basic narrative where Jesus tells a story, say the prodigal son, for example. He simply shares a story about a father and two sons, and it conveys a truth that we can glean from. But then there's also something called a simile or a similitude, which is a comparison to something else. Those are the ones we're going to focus on for the next few weeks. They all start with the kingdom is like, or the kingdom of God can be compared to. So the series is the kingdom is like. Which kingdom? God's kingdom. Good. Not the kingdom of America, not the kingdom of your household or your desires. The kingdom of God is like and then Jesus uses things that we can understand in order to explain it to us. Now, keep in mind context. Jesus was speaking to an agrarian society, and so a large number of them are farm in nature. If I were to come up to you or a random crowd of people and say, I'm going to share a story, a simile about the kingdom of God, what kind of story would you initially think I would share? Kristen says something about electricity. Most people would say, oh, big armies, glory, you know, gold and bright lights and power and majesty. Those are all wonderful things. You would think he would talk about, you know, scores of golden chariots and heavenly soldiers waging war against the darkness and, and strength and wonder. Nope. You know what Jesus starts with? A farmer throwing some seed on the ground, and most of it doesn't grow. That is his first story with the kingdom is like. It's about as far from the big, loud, majestic th that we could think of, which honestly, that's how Jesus showed up. He came small, right? 
the more we understand the kingdom of God, the more we realize it's all about the growth. The kingdom of God in what Jesus describes over and over again is about the growth. It's something that starts small and grows. Jesus says, actually, that the kingdom will expand without end. This idea is continual growth forever and ever, and we have a part in it. So his explanations to us is so that we, if we have ears to hear, may become a part of the growth. So we have two types of parables, which I said. We have narratives and similitudes. We are focusing on similitudes. These are kingdom stories. They are used to show heavenly mysteries, and I'm using the word mysteries here because Jesus used it. They are mysteries that are shared in common, understandable scenarios. They're actually quite straightforward. They're quite simple, and to those who have faith and ears to hear, they mean quite a lot. Though simple, they do hide deep truths. They hide truths. Jesus says as much about the kingdom of God. They're hidden in the story. A couple of the stories Jesus actually goes out of his way to explain to the disciples, but only after they ask him about it. The rest of them he does not seek to explain. And by the way, he never explains the parables to the crowds. He waits. He invites, he gives a teaser, and then waits. It's almost like as if Jesus was just giving trailers about the coming film. Hey, come check it out. Come check it out. He never gives us enough information in any one story to have a whole picture. In fact, the Bible's like that. Where in the Bible do you see a systematic proof laid out of God's existence? Nowhere. It simply declares that he is. In Romans, we have a verse that says people are without excuse. It means we should have enough evidence of who God is in the nature around us to begin the journey. It doesn't mean we come to a full understanding of him. It means there's just enough to get us going. And every time we come to the Lord in faith, it's like he just reveals just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. That's what the parables are. They're just little nuggets. It's like, hey, this is what it's like. This is what it's like. This is what it's like. But each one on its own is not a complete picture. And each one of them actually doesn't make sense if you don't already have some measure of faith. To each is a portion to measure of faith, it says in the word. So we've already talked about what they are. Why in the world did Jesus use parables? Why didn't he just come out and say, I'm going to explain the kingdom of God in great detail so that everyone in the room can understand it? Okay, as a, as a type of teacher and for any people who identify as teachers in the room, it drives me crazy when someone doesn't give the whole picture. It just does. It's against my very nature in the way that I think to not explain everything. In fact, today I'm going to do that. I'm going to be as complete as I can. But that's not how Jesus chooses to teach. And again, I think it's because Jesus is not intending to be Greek in the way that he deals with things. There's a term, if you guys know it, called gnosis, where we get the term Gnosticism. You guys have heard the term Gnostics, Gnosticism? Okay, Gnosticism is this idea that I will learn through my education and knowledge secret wisdom, secret understanding, and I will then become more like God. In fact, there was a growing, in, it was growing in popularity in Roman times in the Greeks that there would be these um, secret religions that were developed. And the leaders of the secret religion would in, initiate people into the religion by giving them all kinds of, I don't know what it is, and I didn't go into too much detail, but they would, they would teach them all kinds of information. And then they would release a play, and it would invite masses to it. Well, the people who were initiated into the secret religion would sit, and to them, the play meant a whole lot more, because the play was all about their secret religion, but it was told in a kind of a parable form. The idea there was, you have secret knowledge, and you have achieved some secret religious thing, and you're closer to our gods, because you know it, and no one else does. It was exclusionary. And what's interesting is Jesus does something somewhat similar, but in a completely opposite way, where instead of saying, I'm going to teach you guys first and then tell a story no one understands, he tells a story most people don't understand except those who really want to know him. Who were the people that were told the mysteries? The disciples. Why was it not the masses? Jesus actually says this, and I'm going to skip, I'm going to start not at the beginning of chapter 13, but we're going to actually go to the explanation. And the reason for this is I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to start with what Jesus says, why? And then we're going to work through the parable, and maybe you'll, you'll see a little bit more of what he's doing here. So the disciples, after Jesus tells his first parable, which we will read, says, why did you, 
Why'd you speak to them in parables? The disciples are even going, come on, Jesus, why can't you just talk plainly? Jesus' explanation says, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And to whoever, or, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away. And then Jesus goes on to say, Therefore I speak in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And then he says this very interesting thing about a fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah, which some translations seem to be quite offensive on. It says, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing but not understand. You will keep on seeing but not perceive, for the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. There are some translations in here that instead of otherwise, the word is lest, which leads us to think Jesus is saying, I'm intentionally obfuscating the truth of the kingdom so that most people can't get it. That's not what he says. How do we know this? For one thing, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world with an invitation to those. For another thing, before Jesus even says this, he says once and then again later, those who have an ear to hear, let them hear. That doesn't sound very much like someone who's saying, I've initiated a small group and the rest of you are fools. What he's actually saying is, most of you are too dull of hearing, too hard of heart to even really want to know what I'm saying. And so I'm going to speak in mysteries and those people who have a relationship with me and are already walking with me will come later and ask me about it and I will give the explanation. And the invitation then is actually inclusionary because he's saying, if there's anyone else in the crowd who wants to know this, come be my friend and I will reveal to you the mysteries of the kingdom. Can I tell you something? God gives mysteries to his friends. That is an offensive term to a lot of churches because it feels Gnostic. But if you are bound up in the Western Greek type of thinking, mysteries means secret knowledge. This is secret knowledge, but the word actually, Tom and I were talking last night, is more translated secret manna, secret life-giving bread that we will receive and it brings life to our bodies. Why? Because as we have relationship with the Lord, he will share with us things that he can't trust to untrustworthy people. Some commentators actually believe that the Pharisees were using spies. If you notice a lot in the Gospels, Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. They were constantly asking him difficult questions, hoping he would say something that they considered heresy so that they could get rid of him. When it didn't work, ultimately they crucified him based on lies. But during this time, they were trying to find Jesus saying something bad so that they could judge him and be rid of him. They were jealous. So if they were using spies, one commentator said it's very likely that Jesus in telling the parables was also completely over the heads of the spies. Why? Because they didn't have relationship. He would tell a story that just seemed like a simple little story. They'd go away with nothing to report. Meanwhile, those who already have a measure of faith are coming and getting fed by it. So in one go, Jesus used a parable that both revealed the faith and brought life to those who are saved or being saved, and it also revealed the dullness of those who were not. He was separating sheep from goats. He was separating the wheat from the tares in the very moment that he's telling the parable because some people, it's like they're triggered, they're turned on by it. I get it. And other people, poof, right over their heads. And on they go. And also, in, in a real sense, too, Jesus sometimes was kind of intentionally offensive to the Pharisees, but never so to the, to the masses. He didn't set out to offend the masses. He didn't say things that were rude or inconsiderate. And I don't know, this is, some commentators have said this. I'm not saying that this is the word of God, but there is the possibility, too, that Jesus was using parables because it was a way to not offend those who just hadn't come to a place of faith yet where they could hear and understand it. It was over their heads. It was just a nice story. So Jesus says this, and after Jesus shares this prophecy being fulfilled from Isaiah, he tells the disciples, blessed are your eyes because they see. Are your eyes blessed today? Blessed are your ears because they hear. For truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous men in years past desired to see what you see, and they didn't see it. And they desired to hear what you hear, and they did not hear it. And from there, Jesus goes on to explain the first parable he'd shared. 
And from there, even in chapter 13, he continues to share parable after parable after parable, only a couple of which he actually explains. Most of them remain unexplained in the Bible. The expectation is that he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We learn not through the basis of our education, but through the basis of our faith. Man, that is hard for me to get as a teacher, as a kind of person who has spent my life absorbing knowledge and being able to rehash it to people. It is a difficult thing for me to contend with the truth that real growth doesn't come from what you know. You cannot intellectualize your way into the kingdom of God. That said, we are to worship in spirit and in truth. You can't be the kind of people who ignore the parables and just have the worship and never have any context or understanding of who he is. The reason Jesus shared the parables is so we would learn. So we must learn. But we must do it not from a place of haughty arrogance that thinks we can learn our way into the favor of God. But instead, we must humble ourselves, come before him, and learn at the feet of a great master. What then do we learn from the parables? Quite simply, the parables contain important truths of how God's kingdom impacts the earth. It shares with us the coming judgments and the reward for the faithful. And some of them are warnings. How do we learn from them? Well, I think I've already said this, but we learn through revelation and humility, not through our minds. The parables actually bypass a lot of our reasoning center unless we have already had a place of humility to learn. So it's interesting to note then the crowds couldn't understand them. I think I said this too, but we need a relationship with the Father in order to know the parables. Well, then let's talk about the parables. Are you guys ready? You feel like you want to dive in and actually start reading these now that we have a setup? Okay, let's go. Chapter 13. Let's start with verse 1. Jesus, on that day, went out of the house. He was in a house, and he was sitting by the sea. That's the Sea of Galilee, for those who would like to know. And large crowds gathered to him. So much so, he got in a boat and sat down. I can picture that crowds are like pushing him at the edge of the shore. And he's like, whoa, 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 okay. So he gets in a boat, right? Floats a little ways out where he can see people. And it says the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And this is where he starts to share the parables. And it says he spoke many things to them in parables saying, now we're going to start with the first one here. And I will say, as, before we start, this is often considered the master parable or the key because it is the parable by which, and we'll talk about this, he actually is describing the very people he's talking to. And then when he explains the parables later, he's actually describing why he is using the parables in describing what the parable means. We'll get back to this. He says, behold, a sower went out to sow, right? A farmer throwing out seed. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky places where they didn't have much soil. Immediately they sprang up because they had no soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. It's probably happening to a lot of our plants today. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came and choked them out. But yet others fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears... Let's say that again. He who has ears, we're going to hear today. Okay, is after this, the disciples then come to him and ask him, why in the world are you sharing in parables? What does it mean? Jesus goes on to describe what we've already talked about and why. And then we'll skip down, actually. We're going to read this too, and then we'll talk about it a little. In verse 18, Jesus then describes the story of the sower. He says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. There's absolutely no place for any root to take place. It's so hard, so hard of hearing, it bounces right off, and there's nothing there. The one on whom the seed was sown in the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yes, I understand it. That's amazing. But then what? There's no firm root, and it's only temporary. So when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Okay, persecution. 
let me ask you this. Your check, your check bounces. Is that persecution? What about you get sick? Is that persecution? What about you're thrown in prison because you refuse to bow down to the new uh, progressive woke agenda? Yes. Good. We're tracking. Persecution arises. There's no deep root. They're scorched out. Because the next one, Jesus then goes on to describe, the one on whom the seed was sown in the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. It doesn't say here this one dies. It says it becomes unfruitful. What were the two things he described? Worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth. Okay, how about this? You get sick and you're hospitalized. Is that, and, and you're terrified and you're suddenly going, I, I know all the stuff you say at church about faith and trusting God, but I have real problems. Does that sound like worry? Or you're putting your own concerns above the truth of the word of God. I've heard people say this. Yeah, I know what you say, but you don't understand. I have bills to pay. I have real problems. Really? Your real problem is that you don't trust God. Your real problem is that you have thorns in your life so much so that you can't produce fruit from the weak-rooted system that's in you. Though, what does it say? The deceitfulness of wealth. Not deceitfulness of wealthiness or wealthy people, deceitfulness of wealth. Now, we know that money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is. So what he's talking about here is wealth is deceitful, and we have to be careful with it. Very easy for me to say, I'll get back to church later, but I have a job. I need, I need to, my business is a priority right now, and once it's taken off, then I'll be able to come back. Actually, I have a friend. He moved from California in pursuit of his business that he'd started. This man used to be on fire for the Lord. He and I were buddies in college. We'd talk about the things of God when everyone else in my Christian school couldn't have cared less. Slowly over time, he became more and more interested in talking about money. And he would tell me, you should, you know what? God really wants you to start a business too. God really, he's going to bless you. God wants to bless you. You're, God's going to bless you. It's, that's all he could say. And I'm like, I am blessed. I got four healthy kids. I got a great marriage. I have a wonderful church family. I'm not crazy. But to him, blessing was more money. I spoke to him recently on the phone, and he made this comment when I shared that, you know what? Wealth isn't everything, and Jesus didn't have a lot of nice things to say about rich people most of the time. You know what his comment was? He laughed, and he goes, isn't it funny how we used to be so caught up in all this stuff the church tried to tell us? He still thinks he's a Christian. Maybe he is. I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge his faith, but I will say the deceitfulness of wealth can very easily choke out, and it is slippery. It very easily makes us feel like it is so important it needs to take all my attention because, hey, I got to support my family. You do. No, you absolutely do. You know why? Because later on in one of the letters, it says, he who does not provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. And there's two ditches here. This is not a message on money. I'll get back to this, I promise. The two ditches are, I am so focused on making money, I abandon the mission of the kingdom of God and the word of the kingdom in my heart, and I become unfruitful. The other ditch is, I'm so spiritual, I'm just going to sit here and wait for God to tell me what to do. I won't work. I'm just going to, you know, sit and meditate. Okay, both are wrong. The truth is, we were made to work. Get a job, do the job, show up at church. Serve in the church. Teach your children to serve God. Let the word have real root in your life. I am, I'm sorry, if I'm making eyes at anyone, it's not on purpose. I'm just scanning the room. This is not designed for anybody in particular. So there's the four different kinds. Oh, sorry, that was three of the kinds. The fourth kind, right, the last one, the one we all want to be. It says, the one on whom the seed was sown on good soil. Say good soil. This is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some 100, some 60, and some 30. Now, for all of you people who are kind of into the numerology, I don't think those numbers have any special meaning. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Hundredfold was very common phraseology to mean really, really big result. 60 and 30 were common gauges of success in fruit, in fruiting, in like 
harvest. Okay, you get 30 bushels, 60 bushels, 90. What kind of bush, what kind of return did you get on your planting? That's what Jesus is talking about. And what's funny is he uses three different numbers. It's not everybody gets 100-fold. Some only get 30-fold. Because to each apportioned a measure of faith, to each of us, it is expected that we will grow as we are able, but that we will produce fruit. The operative portion here is that they produced fruit. The unfruitful were worthless. The fruitful had value. I don't care if your fruit's tenfold. If you can produce fruit and you're doing your best, that's what God's looking for. He doesn't give you goals and metrics and then judge you at the end of the year and give you a 360 report. What he's looking for is faithfulness. What he's looking for is good soil. So what did that good soil have? The ability to sustain a root system. It could receive the rain. It could receive the seed. It could grow. It wasn't so overcome by thorns and stones that it would die and kill off everything that was planted in it. I've heard whole messages on this one parable. I've heard whole messages that talk about how it's up to us to get the stones and the thorns out of us. Do you know what Jesus is actually getting at here? He's talking about condition of the heart. Now, yes, the condition of the heart may change, but he wasn't saying, then you should go and get the thorns out. He's saying, most people have too many thorns and stones to even receive it. That's scary. And the reason that matters, and I promised you I'd get back to this, is because let's look at who Jesus was talking to. Let's look back at why Jesus used parables in the first place. He sowed a seed. In order for the message of the parable that he shared to have any root in their lives, it first needed to go down into them and sprout. That's what happened to the disciples. They came back to Jesus. It's like, this is already working in us, Jesus. We, we don't understand it. How come you didn't share with them more plainly? We want to know. Good soil. What about the masses? They didn't come ask Jesus. Maybe a few did, but the... the Word of God does not record the masses coming to ask Jesus about it. It says the disciples did. The masses wandered off. Probably most of them were too hard of hearing to even hear it. The irony here is in the very parable itself, Jesus was telling them what kind of person they were, and they didn't even hear it because they were too dull of hearing in the first place. He was fulfilling the truth of the kingdom of God as like from that parable by the very onset of the parable itself. I think in millennial, or uh, Gen Z speak, that would be called savage. Am I right? Like, that's savage. That means, wow, he really, it's like, you, you got him. It's like, you shared the message, and you, like, it was so true. It was actually true in the moment it came out, and the people themselves were in the midst of it, but didn't even know it. Is this making sense? Okay. <laughs> Jesus, in explaining all this, then, is telling us something. He's telling us if we hear it, right? What did it say? The good soil is the person who hears the word and then understands it. Let's go back again. We think sometimes that we learn things and then understand it and then become hearers. No. You know, there's a lot of Christians that know all kinds of stuff about the word of God and have absolutely no change in their life. I'll even go further. Not only has there been no change in their life, they actually have no real desire for it. They go to church and are Christians because culturally that's what they do. They were raised that way. Um, they know it's good. I want to go to church for my kids. I should be a better dad, a better mom, all that nonsense. That is not why you get saved. You know why you get saved? Because God has revealed himself to your heart and it has changed who you are at your very core. Anything else, anything else is Western Gnosticism masquerading as faith. Anything else is hard soil, rocky soil, or thorny soil. And Jesus basically started by saying, let's go through a series of stories, and I'm going to start by explaining why they're this way in the first place, and then you won't get it. And some of you will come and ask me, and I'll explain it to you. Three years later, some of these disciples still were having trouble getting it, but they were the good soil. Good soil doesn't mean the plants don't struggle to survive. It means they do survive. Good soil doesn't mean you don't wrestle through the things of God and fight. I have said this so many times in things, classes I've taught. Real Christianity takes grit. Have you ever seen a plant grow? It doesn't look like it's struggling. But the best rooted systems often are the ones that go through the worst struggles. But the soil's good. Bad soil will kill any plant. 
good soil is conducive to growth, the plant suffers. The soil doesn't. If you have good soil, the Word of God may still take a while to grow in you. But as long as it grows and you produce fruit, you're saved. And if you're sitting here today saying, I feel like I know a lot of stuff about God, but my life's a mess, you know what? Don't automatically lump yourself in the bucket of the rocky soil. There may be rocks in your soil. There may be thorns in your soil. But the truth is, the soil is the kind of person we are. And if you are wrestling through it and the desire of your heart is to say, I want to know God, I would say you have good soil. Don't give up. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. All right. I know it's almost 1130. Can I share one more parable? We're going to do one more today. Jesus immediately going through this then presents another parable to them. This is verse 24. He says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Okay, so now he's assuming all the seed and the soil is good. But while his men were sleeping, his farm workers, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. A tear is something called darnel. It's a type of wheat-like plant. It looks just like wheat. The difference is it has no head of wheat. It's a fruitless wheat. So the enemy sowed fruitless wheat in the field, tares, and then went away. Some enemy shows up, scatters a bunch of bad seed, and runs off. But, it says, when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And the master says to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves then say, well, do you want us then to go and gather it up, take out the tares? Can we rip them out of the field? And he says, no, because if you're out gathering up the tares, you might uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say to those reapers, first gather the tares, bind them in bundles, and burn them up, and then gather the wheat into my barn. Now, what's nice about this one is Jesus, again, gives an explanation. We're going to skip a little bit in the chapter if you're following along. In verse 36, it says Jesus left the crowds and went in back into the house. And then his disciples came to him and said, Hey, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. And I'll read the explanation and then we'll talk about it for a minute. Jesus says the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, right? The field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the, the Christians, those who are saved, the faithful, you guys. Okay, then what are the tares? They are the, ooh, everybody else. And who's the enemy who sowed the tares in the field? The devil, All right. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So Jesus is essentially saying, here's the building blocks. It was an analogy. It was a similitude, right? The kingdom is like. It was an analogous story of something true in a context they could understand. So then he goes on to say, uh, so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. There's a reference to hell. If any of you are struggling with the idea of hell, he says it right there. The Son of Man will send forth his angels. They will gather out of the kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. Those are tares. Stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. And he will throw them into the furnace of fire, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And then he says this phrase. Good. I think we're going to repeat that a few times in the next few weeks. So let's, uh, let's dig into this just for a minute before we end. What do we have this time? Good soil, good seed, sown by the son of man. But this time, the seeds are not the word of God. The seeds are people. Sown in good soil. Everything is good soil in this story. And then along comes the devil. And he's like, hey, I'm going to toss some bad in there. I'm going to put evil in the world. I'm going to see what happens when I put this stuff in here. Let's see if I can ruin this crop. And it all sprouts. First thing that I notice is the tares and the wheat were not identified as separate until one thing happened. And that was the tares, the tares failed to produce fruit. They looked just like the real thing, but they couldn't produce fruit. What did the wheat produce? Wheat, but yeah, fruit. Okay, we'll, we'll go with that. The wheat produced wheat. The tares did not. The difference between them wasn't how they looked. It wasn't how they grew. It wasn't the soil they were in. It was their fruitfulness. Mm. 
That's sobering. What is fruit? We understand the analogy, right? We are called to be wheat, not tares. What is fruit? Yes, you could talk about all the things you're going to fulfill and do for, for God, your, your ministry. Let's, let's boil this down to what the Bible says. The fruit of the Spirit. Let's start with that. Here's the fruit that should be coming out of our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, we're getting there, faithfulness, and self-control. Mark's favorite is self-control. Good for you. Some people are still working on that one. Okay, this is the fruit. Do you all perfectly exhibit it all the time? Thank you for being honest. Do we, do we desire in our innermost being to exhibit these all the time? Absolutely. Hallelujah. You know what good soil produces? Yeah, good fruit. Thank you. Sorry, that was, that was tricky because the last one we weren't quite sure. Okay, it produces good fruit, right? What did I say about the plants? You know, sometimes plants struggle. If they don't get enough water, they struggle. They don't get enough sunlight, they struggle. They're too cold, they struggle. Too hot, they struggle. There's a lot of reasons plants struggle. But generally speaking, they make it. A fruitful plant will produce fruit. I have, I have many plants in my yard. I've talked about this before. Many fruiting plants. Some years are better than others. I don't get it. I'm not a good farmer. But this year, everything was like falling off the tree, pulling the, pulling the branches down. It was so fruitful. It was awesome. Next year, maybe not so much. As long as it produces fruit, I won't cut it down. But in the year that tree stops giving me fruit, you know where it's going? In the trash. Oh, the fire. In the fire. Yes, right. In the fire. We don't burn fires in California. We can't do that. Um, in the proverbial fire of my garbage can. That's where the unfruitful tree goes. Okay, so if we are saved, again, we got to be careful not to think I can understand the story and manipulate the way I behave to become something. Ooh, this is hard. This is hard. These parables go past the intellect and into the heart, into the motivations. You hear this today and you're thinking, well, I don't really like Jesus or God or any of that, but I know I should be good and my mom's sitting over there. So I better behave better? Hmm, you know what? I pray that God would change your heart. God's arm is not too short that it cannot save. But there is something Jesus is pointing at here in both of these parables, and that is there are many people who just aren't fruitful. They just aren't wheat. You cannot make a wheat out of a tear. There is evil in the world. I will say this. This parable, Jesus makes very clear, the soil is the world. The soil is the world. That means that what we're looking at here is a global context. God has brought good into the world. The devil has sowed evil into the world. Anyone who ever asks you, why does God allow evil into the world? Point them to this. Jesus makes it pretty clear. Somehow, if God were to suddenly remove all evil out of the world, it could uproot us as well. So what does he say? Let's allow them to grow together until the harvest and he says the harvest is the end of time. End of time. Yes, the kingdom of God is continuing to grow, will continue to grow forever. It says without end. That doesn't mean evil immediately ceases. There does come a time where evil ceases when every tear is cast into the fire. And the wheat, that's us, we're gathered together into the barns. We're brought to heaven. But Jesus makes no bones about it. The tares are here to stay until the end of time. We can't wonder and start questioning God's sovereignty when evil things happen to us. Something in the sovereign nature of God understands more than we do that the evil is now going to have to stay until he is done with what's happening in the world. It's up to us to produce fruit anyway. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so then you could also say at some level this is about the global work of God in the earth. Do you know what tares are? I said it's everything that's not Christians, but let's be a little more specific. Tares are people that are wrapped up in ideologies and things that are not of God. You can have a church that's full of tares. You can have a movement that looks just like Christians and produces no fruit. You could have a church that talks about God and can't produce any life and fruit out of it because there is no faith working. There is no relationship working. There is only knowledge. And where there is only knowledge, as we know from the last parable, 
you can't really have fruit. A tear, then, would be someone who's full of the knowledge. Uh, this is one example. There are many types of tares. One example would be someone who's full of the knowledge of the things of God with no fruit out of it. Prancing around, calling themselves Christians and living like the devil. People who make agendas that fit the world's current flavor and then try to redefine the word of God have no power, have no fruit, and only produces death. It will be burned. So one thing for us to consider then is when we're looking at our own lives, I'm not going to say, are you a tear or are you weak? Because if you are, that's pretty much already established. But the way Jesus describes this, it's either a tear or a wheat. The soil is what it is. What we can do about it is have ears to hear. The invitation is, hey, if there is anything in you where, the, where God has revealed himself to you, don't let that die. Respond to it through faith and humility. What made those people fruitful? And what Jesus tells the disciples is to you it has been granted. What did they do? They came back to Jesus and they said, tell us, help us, help me. The faithful say, help me. Help me grow. Help me understand. Teach me. I am here. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will be your teacher. How could you possibly be taught without the Holy Spirit? I cannot make you understand this. If you are hard of hearing today, you will hear all this, nod your head, that sounds great, walk out and do exactly what you did before, and nothing will change. When the Holy Spirit's your teacher, you hear the Word of God, and it does something in you. And you walk away uneasy sometimes by it, and going, oh, that's working in me. You know why? Because sometimes growing hurts. Have you, any of you ever experienced pain in growing? I love the quick hands. You guys are probably in the middle of it. You're growing faster than the rest of us sometimes. Who, in the end of that parable, is doing the sorting? No, God, through angels. The Son of Man, it says the angels gather him up. And the Son of Man will sort. I, I, that was a trick question, Kristen, because the way you read it, it's not, oh, the angels are doing the sorting. No, the angels are doing the gathering. But what's really happening here? The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and it says, and will throw them in the furnace of fire, the, the lawless, and then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. God will do the sorting. The response for us today is, do we have ears to hear? And if we have ears to hear, which I think we all do, what is our response in this? It's a response of faith. It's a response of humility. It's saying, Lord, teach me. Not through the basis of my understanding, but through the basis of my relationship with you. God shares secrets with his friends. What does it mean to be a true friend of God? I can say, what does it mean to be a true child of God? What does that mean for us? It means we have a humble attitude where we say, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. I want to know you. Have you ever prayed that? I want to know you. Or maybe it's more desperate. God, I must know you. God, I have to know you. I have to have you in my life. I can't live another moment without more of you. This is why Tom always talks about prayer on Saturday nights. Some of us, the night doesn't work, but if it doesn't, we should have a place in our week where we are doing exactly that. A place where we are crying out before God, saying, Lord, I have to have you. Because you probably know well enough in your life, every day you don't pray that, something just isn't right. You start to drift, right? Plants that don't receive regular watering, do something. It's called wither. You can have good soil, but we still need the water. We can have good seed in us, but we still have to grow. A righteous man may fall seven times, but get back up again. I loved when you said that last week. That was one of my favorite verses. I don't care what you have struggled with. I don't care. The truth is, if you are a wheat, your job is to grow up and produce fruit. If you struggled your whole life to grow up and produce fruit, guess what? Today's the day. 